I'm going to do something today that I don't usually do. I'm going to charge for this lesson. So as we get ready to, to gather together a collection, I'd like you to dig deep and pay a little bit of your attention to me. Do you think about attention that way? Do you think about it like something that you pay, a resource that you have, that you pay to different things? I'm really interested in, in the resources that God gives us, and so I kind of track them throughout the scriptures. Resources like talents and abilities, uh, opportunities, time and money and attention. It's our responsibility to use those resources for gain in this life, for his gain. In the parable of the talents, the servants are asked to give an account of how they managed the resources that the master gave them. When you think about paying attention, think about a little coin popping out of you like a, in a video game and going to the thing that you're paying attention to. Where are your coins going? They're kind of spreading out from us all the time, going to different places. Even while you're listening to me, you could be paying attention to other things. I'm going to talk about attention. Sometimes we, we put together attention and time, but I'm going to talk about attention differently this time. I'm, I'm speaking more of your mental engagement, your thought, your meditation, your consideration, the, the brain power that you apply to something. Because really, you can spend time doing something and not really be paying attention to it. And you can be paying attention to something, watching out for something, without really taking time to do it. This topic is such a pervasive topic throughout the scriptures that it's really from cover to cover because when God speaks, he wants us to pay attention. Otherwise, he wouldn't speak. The Bible uses a lot of different words to highlight that idea. Words like seek and remember and hear and take heed to beware, to be on your guard, set your mind on, fix your eyes on consider to mind something or watch something and there's many more scriptures than I can cover today but posted on the website are is my outline along with a bunch of bonus scriptures listing a bunch of Greek words and all the passages that they're used so if you're interested in this topic I really kind of want to help you see the scriptures through this lens focusing on pay attention passages where God asks us what to be thinking about what to be putting our attention on but there are a lot of different passages that I won't be able to cover that you can find in those notes. Our attention is valuable, and we need to spend it wisely. There are others in the world that value our attention, sometimes more than we do. They actively seek to capture it and to hold it as long as they can, and then to sell it to other people. Places like Google and Facebook and YouTube and TikTok and television shows and, and streaming Netflix and things like that. They want your attention because they can sell that to advertisers to the tune of billions and billions of dollars. Your attention is very valuable to them. They employ astounding resources to catch your attention. Back in the 90s, one of the greatest chess players of all time was beaten by an AI for the first time. And then the, one of the, the number two Go player in the world was just beaten. At, these are tests that we consider to be Uniquely human, intelligent activities, and our best people have not been able to beat artificial intelligences that have been developed. And far more advanced artificial intelligence than that is active now, trying to solve a problem. They're trained on you and on me. They're trying to find out what will keep us watching, what will keep us clicking one more time or spending a few more minutes paying attention to them. And they're going beyond your conscious mind, what you would consciously choose. They have a term for it. They call it your lizard brain. They're looking for things even below your conscious level that will attract your attention. And they may know you better than you know yourself in some ways. How are we going to combat these and other things that are trying to capture our attention? Well, the thing is we can waste our attention just like we can waste our time and our talents, and our opportunities. And one thing I can tell you for sure is that Satan wants your attention. 
And the question is, how is he going to get it? How is he going to use, he's going to use those tools and others to attract our attention. I'm going to read a lot of passages, more than you can look up today. I'll put them up on the board, but you'll also be able to reference them later. So I'll try to make it as, I'll try to highlight in the passages the words that are about attention. In 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, it reminds us that we should be sober-minded. We should be watchful because our adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. He is after us, those that he, have not, that he has not caught yet. Luckily, Paul reminds us in 2 Corinthians 2 and 11, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his designs. His strategies and his plans are not unknown to us. We can be forewarned and forearmed, which helps us. The first thing that I'll talk about that Satan uses to get your attention is false teaching. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 8, it says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit, according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. See to it, it comes from a Greek word that means beware, watch out. Beware that you don't get taken captive. This kind of teaching is the stuff that you'll find, uh, it's reasoning that seems to make a lot of sense. It's based, unfortunately, it's based on earthly things, on temporal things, uh, really grounded in the physical world. So its conclusions are only useful for the physical world, but they do make a lot of sense, and these are the things you'll hear uh, on TV, at, in schools, teaching from schools, and also um, at work, amongst your employees and amongst your friends. We need to watch out for those things. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 14, Paul says, Nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculations rather than the stewardship from God that is by faith. This devote themselves is is about giving heed, about paying attention to, about focusing yourself on myths and endless geologies. You can see that these, they cause more questions, questions that can't be answered. They'll chip away at our faith rather than godly edifying, which is the King James Version, the stewardship from God that builds up our faith. So we need to not pay attention to the myths and endless genealogies that spark those questions. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, later on, Paul says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. There's going to come a time when people are looking for other teaching. And what it says is that there are deceitful spirits, even seducing spirits, the King James Version says. Things that will be interesting to us, that will be teachings that that we want to hear, that, that sound kind of neat and new, and teachings that come directly from Satan, but sound like they're coming from God. We need to not pay attention to those or devote ourselves to those. And in chapter 4, verse 7, he tells Timothy specifically, have nothing to do with irrelevant, irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. Those things are the opposite of godliness. They draw you away again into worthless talk. Godliness is the answer to that. We shouldn't even have anything to do with those things. Don't pay attention to them. In Titus chapter 1 and verse 14, he says, Not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. These are the kind of teaching that they were facing at the time, Jewish uh, bringing in the old law, but also Commandments of men, like the scribes and the Pharisees were teaching like doctrines, the commandments of men. These are teachings that surround even faithful congregations, things that are always trying to find a way in and a foothold into the congregation. And we are not to pay attention to them because Satan aims false teachers at us. He tries to grab our attention with those. Another thing that Satan will use to draw our attention away is scoffers, people who say that there is no God or that Jesus isn't coming again. Very popular and pervasive in our culture today. 
In 2 Peter chapter 3, in verse 17, Peter says, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. The context of this passage is he's talking about the people in the time of the flood who said, day by day, things have been going on just like they always have. Um, nothing is going to happen here. And you've heard that before. It's been 2,000 years since the Bible was revealed, since Jesus came. Uh, I don't think he's coming. Maybe he doesn't exist. You're going to hear those things over and over again. But they did say those things at the time of the flood, all the way up until it started raining. And we know that they were wrong. And Peter encourages us to, to take care and to make sure that we don't fall away because that will draw after those things because they will chip away at our stability, the thing that keeps us strong and stable. Satan will also use distraction and anxiety to pull our way our attention. In Luke chapter 10, it's a familiar passage where Jesus visits Martha and her sister Mary. Uh, Martha welcomed him into her house, and she had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to his teaching. But Martha was distracted with much serving, and she went up to him and said, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has chosen the good portion, which will not be taken away from her. Jesus specifically, I mean, we note that she's distracted by paying attention to the serving when Jesus is right there teaching. And Jesus himself notes that it's her anxiety and the troubles with all the things around her that has distracted her from the one thing that's truly important. And it will to us today, especially during this time of pandemic, the 2020 and 2021. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks repeatedly about not being anxious about the things of the world, that the clothing, the food that we need, all the things that the Gentiles seek after because God knows you and he's paying attention to you. He knows what you need and he will take care of you. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Paul says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. The solution to anxiety is to give God our problems, but if we're overtaken by anxiety or troubles, it will choke out the word within us. The next thing that Satan will use to get our attention is the biggest thing, our desires and our lusts. In 1 John chapter 2, and verse 50, verses 15 through 17, he says, do not love the world or the things in the world, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And I'm going to say that loving something is paying attention to it. <laughs> that may be a stretch, but... For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The number, these things are around us in every way. Uh, the number one use for the internet is still pornography and sexual things. It's full of things to tempt our eyes, the things that we want, the things that we want to get. Social media and Facebook, they're all about comparing ourselves with each other, about talking about how great our lives are, gathering likes, really pride. These things uh, threaten to take over all of our attention and all of our life if we don't fight against it. The, during the recent sale of TikTok, a person said, uh, TikTok can take over your life. You really need to pay attention to it. So I've put careful limits on my life, and I spend no more than eight hours a day on TikTok. <laughs> that person is struggling to keep the internet down to eight hours a day. There's no time for anything else if that's your limit. It's so easy because, again, that's what they want. They're striving to keep you trapped in that way. In Luke chapter 12, verse 15, Jesus tells them, And he said to them, Take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. 
Our, our culture is always attempting to turn us into consumers, to people who focus on gathering everything that we can gather together. And Jesus specifically says you need to take special care. You need to guard yourself so that covetousness does not take over your life because that's not what life consists of. In Luke chapter 21, verse 34, he says, But watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, for that day came, come upon you suddenly like a trap. This day that he's talking about may be the destruction of Jerusalem or the end of the world or any important day. What he's basically saying is if our lives are filled up, if our hearts are weighed down with partying, with drunkenness, even the cares of our life, that we'll be unprepared for the, for the important times that are coming. We have to watch ourselves so that that doesn't happen. Because if we're not paying attention, it will. These are the big things in our life. These are entertainment, movies, sports, shows, books. There's an infinite amount of things to learn. And I love to learn. Uh, there's so many books and classes and things on the internet. I could spend forever on that. There's so many things to get, so many games to play. There is the flesh and its desires. There are earthly things. And there is the urgency of right now. These things are the things that Satan uses to capture our attention. He works hard to capture our attention. But God has a legitimate claim on our attention because he created us. He has a plan. He has an intent for what we should be paying attention to. And the first thing he wants us to pay attention to is our aim, our purpose here in life. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 4-5, through 5, he says, No soldier uses an example of soldiers and, and a, an athlete. No soldier gets entangled in civilian pursuits since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. An athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. I love that word entangled because it says that our daily life, the, the regular things that we do, would entangle a soldier. They would wrap up the legs, reduce the effectiveness and movement of a person who is aiming to please the one who enlisted them. A soldier focuses, pays attention to the things that he is here to do. And I really like the athlete example, too. Because how do you compete according to the rules? Well, you have to know them, and you have to be paying attention to them. If you're a runner, you stay in your lane. You don't start running until the gun fires. The entire act of competing in an athletic event is always paying attention to the rules and executing on them. God also intends for us to think about things that are above, to think about spiritual things, about eternity. In Romans chapter 8, verse 5, Paul says, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit set their minds on the things of the Spirit. I love this sort of picture of like our minds as a dial. <laughs> we need to turn that setting to spiritual things. We need to set it. There's a lot of things in the world that are pulling us to set it according to the flesh, but we set our minds on things of the Spirit. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 2, he says, set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on the earth. Again, we're surrounded by the things on the earth. It takes an effort to set our minds higher. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, Verses, one and, uh, verses 16 through 18 is one of my favorites. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. This is like the opposite of the lust of the eye. This is, we don't pay attention to whatever shiny thing is being flashed in front of our eyes. We're looking at things you can't even see. We're focusing on the invisible, eternal things. God's intent is for us to pay attention to Jesus. 
Jesus, our Lord and our Master, the perfect example that we're aiming ourselves for, our Savior. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 15, Paul says, speaking of his own salvation, not that I have already obtained this or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on to the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those of us who are mature think this way or have this mind. And if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal also that to you. This is the mind that we should have. We should be not paying attention to the things that are past, but, but looking to the goal that's set before us, focusing on where we're going and reaching ever higher, straining to be more like Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, uh, you remember Hebrews 11? We just studied that recently. It's the chapter that talks about those faithful people who lived and suffered and and have passed on to their reward. It pictures them as if they're sitting in a giant stadium and that we're in the center experiencing our uh, uh, spiritual Olympics. And by way of encouragement, Paul, or the writer, says, Wherefore, seeing that we also are encompassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us. This besetting is, is much like that entangling that the, uh, the soldier would experience. It's the thing that slows us down, that stops us from running effectively. It's the sin that we need to set aside to run more effectively. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. I love this passage because it points out that a lot of the struggle that we face as Christians is in our minds. It's in our head. This is where the struggle happens. This is where we can get tired and weary. And that if we consider Jesus and what he suffered and how he went through it, that can help us not to get tired in our minds awesome. God also wants us to think about each other. In Philippians chapter 2 verses 4 through 5, he says, let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. And this mind is the mind that was willing to give up equality with God, to take on the form of a servant to live a hard life full of service, and eventually to give himself up, to sacrifice himself for our own salvation. This is the mind that we should have, what we should be paying attention to while we think about the interests of others. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, it says, Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. This is what YouTube is doing. YouTube is trying to spark our attention, trying to find something that will grab our attention and make us follow it. This is our chance to be like YouTube for each other. This just happened to me, actually, and it was kind of a surprise. I was talking to my dad about when I was making this lesson, and I mentioned that Psalms 110, 119 is an amazing passage, and it's just full of this incredible perspective that David has about the Scriptures. And I talked to him the next day, and he said, you know, I read Psalm 119 after you mentioned it. That is an amazing passage. And I thought, hey, that's it. I just provoked him to good works. I just put something on his stack of reading by mentioning it. This is the stuff that we can do for each other. We can, I love the King James Version that says provoke. It's like, um, I dare you to read Monday's passage. <laughs> that's in our reading. I dare you to talk about Jesus to someone tomorrow. We can provoke each other to love and good works, but we have to consider each other that way. We have to pay attention, or we may not do it. <coughs> in Philippians chapter 3, verse 17, he says, Brothers, join, me, join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. 
Paul is saying that we should look around and mark people who are living good Christian lives. We should look at them and we should imitate them and follow their example. What a great way to pay attention to others. Well, not only does God want us to pay attention to others, but he wants us to pay attention to ourselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12, he says, Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed lest he fall. We need to watch out. We need to pay attention. We can't live our lives on autopilot. This is saying that if we're not paying attention to what we're doing, then we're apt to fall. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 1, this is a passage about going and rescuing brothers who are caught up in sin. But watch what he cautions them to do. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. While we go out to save these people and bring them back, we need to be very careful, paying attention to ourselves so that we don't get stuck, we don't get drawn away. In James chapter 1, we get that picture of looking into the law of liberty like a mirror. We should consider our face. We should pay attention to what we look like when we see our reflection in the word of God. Because if we don't pay attention to it, we'll be a forgetful hearer. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, he says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to that which we have heard, lest we drift away from it. This is specifically comparing the glory and the punishments of the old law with the much greater salvation and wonder of the New Testament. And he's saying we need to pay much closer attention or we may drift away. And if we do, how much more punishment will we be worthy of for neglecting so great a salvation as that which we have? God also wants us to pay attention to good things. This is one of my favorite passages. I have many of them, as you can see. This passage is posted up on my wall, up above my television. Uh, Michelle Amelong actually stuck it up for us. And it's a great thing to see while you're watching whatever is going to be on the TV, because we should be looking for this. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. This is, this is meditate on these things, dwell on these things. And when I think about meditating, that brings me to Psalm 119. Now, some of you in the back may not be able to read this. It's a huge passage. <laughs> I'm only going to be able to, to give you a brief overview, but... If there's one thing you want to take out of this lesson, it's please read Psalm 119. Luckily, the elders have also asked us to read it later on in this year. We're in total agreement there. It's an amazing passage. David starts the passage with the premise of God's law is awesome. I love his rules. And, you know, where am I going to seek it? How am I going to keep it in my heart? When am I going to need it in this way? And how am I going to use it in this part of my life? He approaches it from every angle, and it's so enriching and wonderful. Um, here's just a few examples. Starting in verse 9, he says, How can a young man keep his way pure? By heeding or guarding it according to your word. Paying attention to your word will purify a man's way. Verse 15, Medita I meditate on your precepts. I fix my eyes on your ways. You see that David is, is arresting his thoughts and his eyes to stay on the way of God. In verse 37, he asks God to turn my eyes away from worthless things and give me life in your ways. It's incredible, but he, he sought after God's law, his rules, before dawn, in the night, before the night watches, at midnight, he said, seven times a day I seek after your will. Do you do anything seven times a day? You know, that's uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinner in between and on both sides. If you, if you do something that often, you're doing it all day. 
Okay, my phone tells me I pick up my phone 44 times a day. So that's all day. But seven times a day to focus on that. Can you imagine what it would be like to live a life of constant attention on God and his laws? It's kind of daunting to think about that. But I ask myself, can, can anybody say that that would be the wrong way to live? There'd be anything wrong with that? I don't think so. But then we ask ourselves, wouldn't it be boring? Or can't we have some fun in our spare time? Do we have to be studying the Bible all the time at every moment? Well, I'm going to read a list of things that, God, that David found in God's law. And I want you to, to ask yourself, is there anything that you want that's not in this list? You could be blessed. You could have hope. You can have freedom from scorn and contempt. Life. Comfort, delight, freedom from shame, be completely informed and wise, to have understanding, discipline, to have a larger or free heart, love, salvation, praise, singing, fear, a portion or a supply, to be companions of good people, safety, stability, hating false ways, Faithfulness, endurance, sweetness, promises, help, an eternal heritage, redemption, deliverance, zeal, support, to be found and not lost, to obtain mercy, to be in awe. You think, is there anything missing in there for you? I can't find it. I've seen some recent studies that are really exciting to me that show that if you spend time meditating and engaging with Scripture with your full attention, your imagination, and all of your self, that your relationship with God and your spiritual and, and your ability to see the spiritual will grow more real to you. It's a skill that we can learn. It takes practice and meditation that the Scripture speaks for. You may be able to hear the voice of God in Scripture better if you take time to listen. You can only do that if your attention is available and focused. In John chapter 10, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for my sheep. I know my own and my own know me. He says that his sheep hear his voice. Not only do we pay attention, should we pay attention to the things that God wants us to pay attention to, but God is paying attention to us. All the way throughout John chapter 10, he explains how he knows us. This is the Good Shepherd passage. In verse 3, it says uh, that he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. Verse 3 says, he goes before them and his sheep follow him, for they know his voice. In verse 11, the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. In verse 14, I know my own and my own know me. He sees us and he hears us. 1 Peter 3 verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. God's attention is an infinite resource, but he doesn't spend it on everyone. <laughs> His ears are open to the righteous. He cares for us. In 1 Peter 5, 7, he says, casting your anxieties on him because he cares for you. He takes care of us. Throughout Luke chapter 6, verse 7, he tells us, God takes care of, is aware of the smallest things, the lilies of the field, the sparrows. He knows them and he takes care of them. He will take care of you. Not only that, he has a plan and a wonderful eternal destiny for us. We just read this in Revelation chapter 1, 21. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and, he will, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning or crying or pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. Isn't that worth paying attention to? 
So where are you spending your attention? As for me, I did a little exercise where I graphed out all my time and I stretched it out until I'm 80. If I spend the time that I'm, that I'm spending now in worship, between now and 80, if I put it all together, I will be worshiping for eight and a half months straight, 24 hours a day. That's from January to mid-September. If I continue to use my cell phone the way I use it now, I'll be on my phone for five years straight. That's four hours a day. I better be using some of that time, a lot of that time, to be doing what God put me here for. And if I put together all the other things, like take out sleeping and working, I have 11 and a half years of free time that I haven't committed yet. What am I going to spend that on? Well, we said Satan wants all of it. By false teaching, scoffers, distraction and anxiety, desires and lusts, he will try to capture all of our attention on sinful things and on godly purposes. But he's happy enough merely distracting us from what's truly important. Like Martha, that's enough. Well, God has a use for our attention. He's asking us to pay attention to our purpose, our eternal and spiritual things, to Jesus, our Lord, to people, others, and ourselves, to his word, his rules, and his good things. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. You know, we'll be required to give an account for every idle word that we speak. What about the things that we dwelt on, the things that we paid attention to and thought about? What about all the YouTube videos we watched? I hope we don't have to account for that. God truly loves and cares for us, and he wants us to go to heaven with him for eternity. God is paying attention to us. Shouldn't we pay more attention to him? We, should all, we could all spend more of our attention on the things that God put us here. That's something we can all do. Let's resolve to do that today and Monday and for the rest of our lives. And if you're not a Christian, isn't it about time you started to pay attention to your Creator? He knows you and He loves you. He has paid the cost for you to be saved. He just asks for you to believe in Him, Jesus, as the Son of God, to repent of your past sins and turn away from them, to tell other people that you believe in Him as the Son of God. He asks you to be baptized in water by the authority of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and to live faithfully until death or He comes again and you will receive that crown of life. If there's anything we can do to help you spiritually get closer to this goal, to turn your life over to God, we're ready to do whatever we can. Come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song.